spread the gay agenda, my lovely boys. Spread it. And I... Fuck yes. I loved it. Hi guys! My name is Zah and welcome back to my channel. Today I will be doing a review and discussion of... The Six of Crows Duology by Lee Bardugo. First book being Six of Crows, the second being Crooked Kingdom. So the Six of Crows um, series is this young adult um, fantasy series that is set in this fictional world where there are these people called the Grisha. So Grisha are people with supernatural abilities. They can heal people, control light, control darkness. They can pull people apart. And they can also fabricate and create things. In this world, the Grisha are treated differently um, in different countries. In some countries, they are part of the army. In other countries, they are slaves. And in other countries, they are hunted down and killed because they are seen as unnatural. So, the Six of Crows series takes place a few years after the previous trilogy that was set in this world ended. You don't have to read the previous trilogy to read this duology. So... The Six of Crows um, series follows um, Kaz Brecker, the criminal mastermind. He's like, he's super smart and he's part of like this gang and he's the brains behind the operation. He's that guy, but he's also emotionally closed off and, you know, he's built walls around him. He's like, no, no one will affect me emotionally. I won't show him my emotions. I'm a fucking badass. I have pulled people's eyes out. I have killed people. Like, I'm I'm a badass. You honestly wonder, wait, dude, how old are you? And then you find out that he's 17 years old. And you're like, that makes no sense. Because why are you behaving like you are a 32-year-old man who's gone through so much shit in his life? And then as you read on, you realize that not only him, but the other characters in the story have gone through so much fucking shit. So we have Kaz Brecker. He is given the chance to basically plan and um, operate an insane heist. So the heist involves freeing a scientist from a military stronghold. This military stronghold is basically the capital city of the country in which the Grisha are being hunted and killed. So this scientist basically has knowledge that will change the very fabric of like the Grisha world. And this information, not, all, not in the wrong hands, but in any hands, in any country, could potentially start a civil war. If Kaz isn't doing it because he's doing it out of the kindness of his heart or the goodness of his heart, he's doing it because he wants to get some fucking money. In the series, he is nicknamed Dirty Hands because he will do any job as long as it pays good money. I'm talking about arson, murder, fucking theft, like collapsing an entire man's wealth, killing people. Dirty Hands has done it all, folks. Like, when I say badass, I mean badass. So Kaz realized that, you know what? I obviously can't do this alone. I need some help. So he enlists the help of five people, two of which are, he won't admit this, but two of which are his closest friends. We have Inej Gafar, who is basically the spy of Kaz's gang. We have Jesper Fahey, who is the sharpshooter, basically Kaz's sort of right-hand man. He's sarcastic, he's snarky, he's funny, he's cool, he's smooth. Love that boy. We have Nina Zenik, who is also a Grisha, and she is a heart render. So heart renders are people who can pull people apart, and um, healers can, like, you know, pull them back together. And we have Matthias Halvar. We'll get to Matthias later. But Matthias is from the country in which... The Grishas were being hunted and killed. This country is called Fierda, by the way. And he was part of, like, the army group or part of, like, the soldiers that were responsible for hunting and killing down the Grisha. And Matthias also has feelings for Nina, who is, you know, a Grisha. That's a pairing that I want to talk about. And then lastly, we have Wylan van Eck, who is Jan van Eck's son. And Jan van Eck is the guy that basically enlisted Kaz to uh, run this operation. So we have the entire cast, like we have the character set, you know, the setup is there and we're preparing ourselves for this heist. But the heist only comes in in the last third of the book. And this is where I want to speak about like these two books. So I'm going to have a non spoilery section and a spoilery section. Um, in the non spoilery section, I'll basically touch on a few things. But then in my spoilery section, I'm going to go way, way deep. And I'm going to interchange between both books. So speaking about Six of Crows. Um, 
I'm just gonna go right off the bat and give this book a three and a half out of five. You know what? I think I'm actually gonna give it a four. The world building is phenomenal. Like if you are a person who would have never read any book set in this world, the world is written so beautifully. It's built so wonderfully. You know, you can easily just immerse yourself into like the cultures and like, you know, the different countries that you are like trekking and going through. The characterization um, the characterization is like really good. This book, and this is, this is, this point will lead me to the pacing. You learn so much about the characters, like the entire second third of this book is just devoted to giving us backstory upon backstory upon backstory, um, about these characters and you learning more about them and how they all interact and how they've all come together and how they all know each other. And I think the second third of the book really affected the pacing of the story. The first third, it was like action packed and we, you know, setting up for the heist and we like, we bring the team together. And then the second part is just, here's some backstory. Oh, here's another flashback. Oh, here's another backstory. Here's another backstory. Oh, oh, here's another flashback. And it's like, dude, I'm tired. I'm tired. I've just been getting flashbacks i'm so done and then when we get to the last third of the book it's like the action and the tension just rises up to an 11 and then i'm like okay right i'm back let's go let's go let's go getting to the last third wasn't my favorite i'm not a fan of like books where we or stories where we bring the team together which is why i kind of like age of ultron more than avengers i like stories where you know, the loyalties and the relationships are being tested, where we see different sides of the characters. I want, I want my, I want my characters to go through the most. I want them to go-ish. I want them to suffer. And I like that, which is why Crooked Kingdom was that girl. Crooked Kingdom, the second and final book in the series, was so much better than Six of Crows. Like, Lee Bardugo really elevated everything. The world building, even better. The characterization, even better. Cro Crooked Kingdom takes place in Ketadam, which is like the capital city of like another country. Even though we are stuck in the city for the entirety of this book, we still learn more about the other countries and about the world. And I feel like Lee Bardugo in Six of Crows, she basically opened the door into this world. But in Crooked Kingdom, she blew the house wide open and you like, whoa! And you're just so immersed into the culture and it's just so beautiful. Like, they're just these lines. And let's talk about the writing. The writing, what? Girl, the writing in Crooked Kingdom, just, it's so simple but elegant. Like, there's just like an elegance to it and it's just so beautiful and you feel all the feels. Like, what? They are... They are I wanted, hmm, I, there are so many times that I wanted to cry in this book because it's just, like, it really pulls at the heartstrings and you really feel all of the feels. Another thing that I didn't really like in Six of Crows was that the arcs aren't complete. Even though we all know that, okay, this is like the first part and there's like going to be part two and those arcs are going to be complete. The way that the arcs are like complete in this book is chef's kiss. It's so satisfying and it's so good, you guys. Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to leave in my non spoilery section. Um, loved the characters. The characters are just so well written. The writing is so beautiful. World building, excellent. The pacing was just a bit off for me in Six of Crows. If you're going to do a character driven story, which is fine. I don't, I don't dislike character driven stories, but I feel like you should try and balance plot and characterization and I feel like Lee Bardugo did a way better job at balancing the two out in Crooked Kingdom as opposed to Six of Crows. So if you haven't read this duology and you don't want spoilers just just go out there go and read it go and fall in love with the characters and then we can come back and then we can discuss okay okay bye non spoilery people Bye! Okay, so it's either you have read the books or you don't give a shit about spoilers. And honestly, that's cool with me. I hope that's cool with you too, Jesper. Jesper in Six of Crows. I liked Jesper in Six of Crows. Like, I thought, like, I feel like there were so many things that I wanted to know more about Jesper. And I think Lee Bardugo, like, basically, you know, played it close to the chest in Six of Crows when it came to Jesper. In Six of Crows, he's just like this, you know, like the smooth criminal. He's like, you know, the guy who's snarky, sarcastic, he's funny. You know, he has, he's very loose-lipped, though. He's basically telling everyone, 
all of the plans that Kaz has. And it's like, my dude, you need to stop being reckless or you're going to get yourself killed. And what happens? Jesper lets out that, oh yeah, haha, me and Kaz, we're going we're gonna to be doing this operation. We're going to be doing a heist. What happens? Inej gets injured. And I was like, honestly, Jesper, that's on you. That's on you, ass. When we find out so much more about Jesper in Crooked Kingdom, it's just like so beautiful. And also watch um, Jesper in Crooked Kingdom struggle with his, you know, gambling addiction and realizing in the end that, oh my gosh, like, I, I need to change my ways, bro. Like, I can't live like this. And it's just not healthy. He realized on his own that, you know what, number one, I, I, I need to work on myself. And I need to realize that I don't want to do this nonsense anymore. Like, I, I know that it's not going to be easy struggling with this addiction. But I also realize that I can't carry on being reckless because it's putting all of the people that I love in danger. And I don't want them to be in danger anymore. So, Wylan in Six of Crows was practically non-existent. I would actually forget that this character was actually there until he was mentioned by the other characters. So in Six of Crows, all of the characters besides Wylan have a POV. So Kaz, Inez, Jesper, Nina, and Matthias have POVs, but not Wylan, which is why it was so difficult for me to actually remember that this guy was there. But in Crooked Kingdom, wow. Oh my gosh. And in Crooked Kingdom, you know, we find out that he he is like he's dyslexic we find out that the minute his father found out that he is dyslexic his father just disowned him he hated him and he didn't love him he didn't give a shit about him we find out that after his mom died Wylan's dad gave even less of a shit about him and we also find out that Wylan's dad dead as sent assassins to go and kill him Mm. All of the time that Wylan thought that his mom died, his mom was actually alive. And oh my god, reading that chapter was so heartbreaking. It was like one of the most painful things that I've had to read. You know, his mom couldn't recognize um, that he is Wylan because, you know, he was disguised as someone else. And we see his mom um, having paintings of his son. And it's just like. <sighs> That was so emotional. And also, Jesper and Wylan. All I can fucking say is gay. The gay shit. The, the gay shit. I was like injected into my veins. That's what I want. That spread the gay agenda, my lovely boys. Spread it. And I... Fuck yes. I loved it. The next two characters that I want to speak about is Nina and Matthias. So how can I describe Nina? I think the only way I can describe Nina is a bisexual queen. And the thing is, we don't know that she's bisexual until Crooked Kingdom. And then when we find out that, oh my gosh, this bitch is bisexual, I'm like, <laughs> excuse me? How could I not realize all this time that this bitch is bisexual? Oh my god. Nina and Matthias. The reason why I wasn't really a fan of the pairing in Six of Crows, like Matthias' character growth also, that, that was, that, yes. So Matthias starts off as this racist, misogynistic, narrow-minded, probably homophobic, probably ableist asshole white boy. You no, know, Kaz needs him because he is from, like, the capital city. He's from the country in which the scientist is, you know, trapped in and he's, like, jailed in. So they need Matthias because, like, he knows the whole building and he knows the complex and stuff. The reason why I didn't really enjoy the pairing at first was because it was, like, a Nazi and a Jew and... Mm -mm. That made me a bit uncomfortable initially because I'm like, Nina, my girl, this person hates your kind. Like, he hates your people. But then Matthias would be like, yeah, you know, I hate the Grisha, but I don't hate you, Nina. Like, thing of like, yeah, you know those other black people? Like, they're shit, but you, you, you my black queen. And I was like, mm, this doesn't feel right. The thing is, in Six of Crows, they would always be like, oh my god, like, the angst and like... Do I love him? Do I not love him? Do I love her? Do I not love her? And it was like, this is, this is it. This is actually what I want. Going back to my Triangulum review, I realized the other day that the only reason why I liked part one was because of the teenage angst. Like, if you're gonna make me happy, give me a fucking book with teenage angst, bitch. Because 
Whoa, that's what I want. That's that's what I want injected into my veins. And that's what they gave me. That's what all of these six characters in the series gave me. Fucking teenage angst. And I loved it. So in Crooked Kingdom, Matthias and Nina, like, they, they, <laughs> Nina wanted, Nina wanted Matthias's dick so bad. Like, literally, there would be silence in the room. And then Nina would be like, let's fuck. And everyone would be like, well, her, only two things would have made Nina happy. Food and dick. And honestly, that's what everyone wants on the TL right now. The way that the characters just grew, these two characters grew in Crooked Kingdom was so well done. Matthias unlearns his misogyny. He unlearns his homophobia. I know he's fucking homophobic. He unlearns his racism. And he unlearns his ableism. I know he's ableist. He unlearns just... He stops being narrow-minded and he just, like grows as a person. I mean, like, <laughs> mm, it really feels like a recovering racist has stopped being racist, but it was also really well done, and it was really cute, and I, I really did enjoy that. It was, it was sad to see him die like that, um, when he was planning to, you know, do so much good into the world to go back to Ferda and help other Grisha people from being killed, and help other people unlearn their palmetic ways. But he was still a recovering racist though, so Nina, also Nina growing as a character, Nina realizing that, you know what, I want to have a bigger agenda than me. I Even though my, the person that I love with all of my heart, my, my, my future husband essentially is gone and he was taken away from me, that won't stop me from going back to Fyodor you know, freeing all of the Grisha that are imprisoned and trapped and, you know, changing the world and just... <laughs> Yo, guys, I'm actually tearing up. Oh, my God. <sighs> wow. The last two characters that I want to talk about is Inej, Gafa, and Kaz Brekka. We learn in Crooked Kingdom that, um, you know, Inej went through the most. We learn a little bit about um, Inej's past in Six of Crows, and we learn how, you know, she was sold as a slave to Tenet, um, this other lady. She runs a menagerie for, like, for women, and it, it's, it's disgusting. It's really gross. And in Crooked Kingdom, we find out about how, like, you know, her, every day, her humanity, her dignity would just be stripped away, and she went through so much, and Edge went through the most. She was separated from her family and sold as a slave and then she became part of like the menagerie and you know you'd have these horrible men just treating her like shit like like an animal and in the end in the end when Kaz finds Inez's parents and they're at the harbor and that reunion and like the words, the things that Inej says when she sees her parents. She drew in a sharp breath, everything in her focused like the lens of the long glass. Her mind refused the image before her. This could not be real. It was an illusion, a false reflection, a lie, a lie made in rainbow hued glass. She would breathe again and it would shatter. Girl. I think that's what I really like about Inej is that like, even though she went through so much, so, so, so much in her life, she still has so much optimism for the future. She still believes that, number one, she is absolutely deserving of everything good the world has to offer. She, she along with her friends, is just as deserving of being treated like their heroes, like they're deserving of, you know, having whatever good in the world. And... It's just so beautiful and she hopes for a better future, not only for her, her friends, but so many other people, slaves across the world and, you know, her, her, her goal to go across the world and sail across the world and free slaves is just, wow, so, so wonderful, so, so beautiful. I loved every moment of it. And, like, her struggling with, you know, in, with Kaz, because, like, you can tell that, like, she really cares for Kaz in a way that, like, she wants to have a future with Kaz, like, in a romantic way. But, you know, she's still so scarred by all of the things that she went through in the menagerie. She still, she still can't be touched, you know, in that way. Because it's just so traumatizing for her. And even then, she's like, you know what? I still love this person. Like, I still love Kaz Breaker. Kaz Breaker 
isn't the best person. Casbreaker isn't a good human being, but, you know, he's still deserving of, you know, redemption and he's still deserving of everything that's good. Honestly, in some ways, Kaz reminds me of a more calm and collected version of uh, Niklaus Michelson. And with that, let's move on to Kaz fucking Bricker. Kaz Bricker in the series, big dick energy. Just a well-written character. And, you know, we find out, guys, Kaz Bricker went through the fucking most. You know, he, them having to sell the farm and then... He's now going to the city with Tuketa Dam with his brother. And then Pekka Rollins being an asshole and swiping away all of their money. And whoo, child. And then we found out that, oh my gosh, like, George, Jordan and Kaz, they got really sick because of the Queen's Plague in Ketterdam. People thought that they were dead. So then they took them and, like, they threw them onto, like, this deserted island. And then when Kaz woke up, he was sitting on a pile of, like, a mountain of dead bodies. And, oh, guys. And then, like, he had to use his brother's dead body to swim back to Ketterdam from that deserted island. What the shit, nigga? And then, and then, it's just, I think, I think for me, I can't really speak that much about Casper without speaking about Inej because, like, they're not codependent. They're dependent on each other because there are moments where you can tell that they both care for each other and they both want to be together, but they still have so much healing to do. And I think they both realize that, listen, I can't be with you right now. I still need to do my own healing. And I know that this healing needs to be done alone. Like, I still need to go through my own path. And, like, I love you so, so much. And I want to be with you. But, girl, dude, just allow me to heal. And they both have that mutual understanding. And they both know that in the future, they will come together. They will be together. But for the time being, they just need to heal. I think, I think that's all that I want to talk about when it comes to the Six of Crows duology. Like, there's just... Guys, just go read it. If you're part of the people who don't care about spoilers but haven't read the books, just go read it. It's just it's just two books. It's two books. And I, kn I know you motherfuckers aren't doing work out there. I know you don't give a shit about online learning. So just spend just one week reading these two books and then we can come back and discuss in the comment section below because there's so much that I haven't spoken about. But there's just... If I had to carry on speaking about it, this video would be an hour long and I don't think you guys give a shit about that. This is my review and discussion of the Six of Crows duology. Um, thank you so much for staying behind and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into the bathroom and just like release my emotions and start crying. Thank you guys for joining me today. Thank you so much for watching, for staying behind and just watch me discuss these books. Yeah, thank you guys for joining me. I will see you later. Bye!